Uh, with that, let's uh, dive in into our trip down memory lane. Uh, in this talk, what we are going to do is explore .NET's memory management, uh, mainly look at what the garbage collector does, what the CLR does, and how we can write software that actually helps .NET help us. That's uh, the goal of the presentation. Right, so the agenda for today. Uh, first of all, for those who don't know about the garbage collector or have a vague notion of what it does, we'll quickly go over what the garbage collector does, and then we'll dive into how we can actually help the garbage collector help us in writing our software. We'll also look a little bit at uh, allocating and deallocating memory and hidden allocations that we may have in our code. Um, we have a section on strings, which is quite an interesting data type in, uh, in .NET. And then we'll just explore the heap using CLRMD, which is a library where we can just query, um, query whatever is in memory and that we may want to explore. So let's go. The garbage collector is part of the .NET runtime. So the .NET runtime, it manages the execution of programs. So whenever we write a program, uh, we host it in the .NET runtime, which does the compilation for us. So whenever we compile in Visual Studio or in Rider, uh, we compile to intermediate language, and then the .NET runtime will, at runtime, actually compile that to machine code and execute it. It manages things like type safety so that it knows that a string is a string, that your person object that you're writing is actually a person object. Uh, it handles exceptions, so it tracks exceptions. It makes them bubble up until someone handles the exception or doesn't handle the exception. Uh, it also looks at security, like, for example, can I actually execute this portion of code? Can I access this specific library that's on the system? It handles threads for us, and the thing that we are going to see in this talk is it also manages memory for us, and it has a garbage collector that also helps in memory management. So memory management in the garbage collector is, I think, one of the key features in .NET, because um, memory management and having a garbage collector gives you some virtually unlimited memory in our applications. You don't have to think about allocating and deallocating memory. You simply assign some value to, to a variable and you basically don't care afterwards because the garbage collector will clean it up after us and make sure that the memory becomes available again. Uh, the way it works is that .NET allocates a big chunk of memory uh, when the application starts and then it manages that block of memory itself. So whenever we create a variable, our variable is actually declared or uh, allocated in that big chunk of memory that .NET already pre-allocated for us. Um, then we have the garbage collector coming around every couple of minutes or every yeah, whenever it runs, uh, which reclaims this unused memory and then makes it available again for later allocations we may want to make. So uh, memory allocation, like I said, whenever you create a new object and you allocate a new object, this is allocated in the so-called managed heap. This is this big chunk of memory that's uh, created at the start of our application. Uh, by doing that, .NET makes allocating memory really fast because it's basically just adding a pointer. It doesn't have to go to the operating system and ask for more memory. Of course, sometimes it have to, has to do it, but it doesn't have to do it for every single variable that we are um, assigning in, in, in memory. Of course, .NET also uses some unmanaged memory for itself, basically stuff that it needs for uh, yeah for its own, like uh, the .NET CLR itself, some temporary storage for the garbage collector itself, things like loading DLLs, the graphics buffer, etc. But generally, whenever we use memory in .NET, it's all allocated in this managed heap. Then uh, we have the garbage collector coming around, and that thing releases objects that are no longer in use. The way it does that is it looks at the different application routes in our application, um, and it builds a graph of all the objects that are reachable from these roots. And if it finds that the object is not reachable, it just removes the object or puts it into the finalizer queue, then releases the memory, compacts the heap, depending on uh, where, you, where you are, so it doesn't get fragmented, and then uh, you're good to go and reallocate that specific portion of memory that was available beforehand. Now, one thing with the garbage collector is it takes time to scan all the different objects that are in memory. So what you will see is that the garbage collector is actually uh, dividing the heap in generations. So you have generation 0, 1, and 2. And those generations typically are um, garbage collected less often the higher the generation. So for example, gen 0 will be garbage collected much more frequently than generation 1 and generation 2. This means if you have a short-lived object, 
uh, for example, a local variable somewhere in a function, this will be allocated in Gen 0. Then when the garbage collector comes around, it will look at the object and if it's still reachable, if it's still in use, it will move it to generation one. The fact that it's still around means that it will keep it around in memory and move it to a higher generation so it doesn't have to rescan it over and over again whenever it runs. Of course, if the object is no longer reachable, it will simply remove it from memory and the memory will become available again. Uh, in generation one, the same thing happens. Uh, so if the object is still alive when gen one is garbage collected, it will move the object to generation two, which is collected even fewer times. Um, and of course, if the object is no longer reachable, it will also be removed from memory. Same thing in Gen 2, if we have a garbage collector happen uh, collection happening there, um, Gen 2 will be collected. If the object is still reachable, it will just stay in Generation 2. Uh, if not, it will be removed and so on. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what the garbage collector does. Uh, next to these three generations, there's also the large object heap which is like a special segment for larger objects. So if you have a really large array or a string that's larger than 85 kilobytes, it will be allocated on the large object heap. Reason for that is those large objects are more difficult to scan because they may have more properties or more fields in them. And the garbage collector just doesn't want to touch them because it would take too long uh, in terms of time to scan those objects. Uh, so typically, it only collects during a full garbage collection of all the different generation. It will go into this large object heap and scan the objects, but it will not defragment whatever is in there by default. So that means if you have a lot of these large objects and they go out of scope or they are collected uh, after a while, this can actually cause an out of memory exception because yep, the objects, uh, the, the memory space there is not defragmented. Uh, when does the garbage collector run? Um, well, that's vague. It depends on the .NET version and there is no real documentation about it, but uh, people have been observing it and usually whenever there's an out of memory condition it runs, so when the system uh, fails to allocate or reallocate memory. Whenever we do a significant allocation, so imagine we are allocating 20 million objects in memory, we can be quite sure that the garbage collector will run after that. Uh, also, when we can't allocate memory, uh, it will all also try a garbage collection to see if it can still fit the object that we want to fit in memory. And of course, there's things like uh, forcing the garbage collector or attaching a profiler and things like that where we also get garbage collection. Do keep in mind the garbage collector is not guaranteed to run, so it may well be uh, that it never runs or only runs after a long period of time, uh, so do be warned while .NET manages the memory for it, um, yeah, you can see that the garbage collector will not always run. Um, if you want to look at the garbage collector source code, by the way, um, you can do so. Um, since .NET is open source now, you can look at the garbage collector source code. Um, if you go to the slides after this presentation, you will find this uh, link. It's 60,000 lines, I believe. So if you're interested in reading what the garbage collector does when it runs, uh, why it is being run and so on, uh, feel free to read through it. It's, uh, it's an interesting bedside story, I would say. All right. Um, so the garbage collector runs very often on Gen 0. Uh, so short-lived objects are typically very fast to clean because they still have few references and so on. So like uh, if you have a method and you create or allocate a variable at the, at the start of this method, Typically, whenever that method goes out of scope, whenever the variable goes out of scope, uh, the garbage collector knows that it can be cleaned and it's really fast to clean it, so it will run typically very often on Gen 0. On higher generations, typically these objects have more references by different objects that are in memory, so they are slower to clean. Uh, problem with that is the higher you go in terms of generations and the more objects and more references you have, garbage collector will um, take a while to run. That's not a really big issue, but the garbage collector also has to pause your running application to do whatever it has to do. Reason for that is that it doesn't want anything to change in memory while it's running because otherwise it would have to rescan all the different uh, object graphs that are in there. So typically these pauses are short, um, but they can be really long. I have seen applications where a full garbage collection took two minutes, which is horrible because it means that during those two minutes your application is not responding and nothing is happening. 
Luckily for us, later versions of .NET uh, have introduced background garbage collection, and those are now enabled by default. Um, they run in the background on a different thread, and they will uh, scan the memory as much as possible without pausing the application, but they will still introduce short pauses um, in the application, typically on one thread, but sometimes on multiple threads. So do be warned, you don't want to make the garbage collector mad. So uh, we can keep the garbage collector happy by helping it avoiding pauses. Uh, one thing to do that is by optimizing allocations. Do be warned, with everything I say during this talk, don't do premature optimization. Measure everything you do and decide for yourself, is it necessary to do this or not? Um, because it may not always be necessary to optimize allocations. And the garbage collector is really good at what it does. Uh, so typically, we don't have to do anything there. Um, so we can optimize or we can just not allocate, but that also means that we don't write software, so that's not going to happen. Uh, things you can do is making use of iDisposable and using statements um, to make use of iDisposable because if you implement iDisposable correctly, you are cleaning up references and actually helping the garbage collector in uh, running through the entire tree of objects that you have allocated. Um, finalizers are also something that can help the garbage collector. <coughs> But do beware, um, if you run a finalizer, your object will be moved to a finalizer queue, which means that it always will move to a higher generation. So while writing a finalizer will really help the garbage collector, you may actually be uh, yeah, making any issue you may have worse. Uh, another trick of helping the garbage collector is by making use of weak references. Uh, weak references are objects that you can allocate in your memory. And whenever the garbage collector passes through them, <clears throat> whenever the garbage collector passes through them, the weak reference will be collected. You're actually telling the garbage collector, whatever happens, this object you can always collect. You don't have to scan the entire thing. Don't check, just collect. So let's uh, let's look at what we can do there. By the way, on all the demo slides, I put this GitHub URL where you can find my demos. So if you want to run these demos yourself or make use of the profiler uh, on top of these demos and go ahead, clone this repo and uh, go wild. All right, let's see if we can help the garbage collector. Uh, where's my Visual Studio? There we go. So in this project, I have a couple of demos and one of those demos is uh, one where we are helping the garbage collector. So what I did here is create a cache object. And this cache object is a typical cache where well, we just want to keep a dictionary of items by ID, which is an integer, and then have a weak reference. What this means is that uh, when the garbage collector comes around, it may be that our data, the thing we actually want to store, is garbage collected and that our cache contains a null reference to that data object. The nice thing about that is that whenever there's memory pressure, whenever the .NET runtime needs more uh, memory, the garbage collector will run and my items will just magically disappear from this, uh, from this cache object. So that's, that's actually quite nice. So what I'm doing in this code is allocating a bunch of those data uh, objects as a weak reference, and then uh, yeah, basically keeping track of whenever we have to regenerate the object. So if the object is null, when there's no value uh, in there anymore, we just create a new data object there. Stupid cache, but just making use of the weak reference there. Let's see if we can run this with the profiler attached. If we profile this one and we make use of uh, the memory profiler, um, dot memory we have, uh, we can run the application, collect allocation data, and see what's happening in there. So if you look at the code, by the way, for these demos, what you will find is that they will print whatever you have to do and so on. So if you want to try this on your own, uh, you can definitely do that. So let's run our first demo. And okay, so what we did now is that we uh, generated a cache of 20 objects. So if we get a snapshot in the profiler and we dive into the objects, we will typically find our cache, that's one item, and we are caching data. And we have, where is it? 
we have 20 weak references to data. So we actually generated 20 items in our cache. That's awesome. Now let's uh, press enter to run the garbage collector. And we can see that we regenerated some objects and some we didn't, but we regenerated about 65% of the objects after the garbage collector cleaned out the data from our weak references. Let's see if we can validate that by getting a snapshot. Then looking at the memory traffic, <clears throat> and if we search for our data, we should see that um, <clears throat> we reallocated 13 objects in this second snapshot. So we reallocated 13 new items of data, which means that the garbage collector actually did its work perfectly. Uh, it cleaned out the data objects that we had in our cache, and they were gone from memory, and our cache had to reassign them later on. So that's, uh, that's really nice. <clears throat> Another way of helping the garbage collector is by creating, uh, by making use of a disposable. So what I have here is a sample disposable, which opens up a file stream to some file on disk and allocates some uh, integer pointer into our uh, operating system. So pretty simple, except that these two objects are uh, members of our sample disposable, so they have to be cleaned up after um, the garbage collector runs, or they have to cl be cleaned up as part of the garbage collection process. So let's uh, see if we can first run this without disposing, and then run this with disposing the application. So what we are going to do is again start the profiler, uh, collect all the data that we have in memory there, and in our demo, we will see that we are first um, running the demo. Where is it? We are first running the demo by not disposing the object. So we are creating a list of 10,000 sample disposables and then just clearing the list and running the garbage collector. We will see that this actually keeps the sample disposable in memory, even though we are collecting the thing. So let's see if that's, uh, if that's the truth. We have the profiler running. Now let's uh, run our second demo and allocate 10,000 objects. There they are. We can get a snapshot. If all goes well and we look at the list of objects, we should have our sample disposable. We have 10,000 of those. So that worked. Awesome. Now let's uh, continue the demo and run the garbage collector. Uh, we can now fetch another snapshot so we can see that it actually destroyed those objects. So we can see that the objects were should, be, should have been removed from memory. Problem is, if we look into the snapshots, we will see that, sorry, let's go there, that our sample disposable is actually still in memory. So while we expected the garbage collector to collect this thing, um, it's actually still in memory. It moved the objects to the finalizable queue and only after a third garbage collection, which we can do, uh, do now, let's do that. Only after a third garbage collection, the objects will actually be removed from memory. So if we now look at the list of objects, this is where they should be removed from memory. So we still have our list and we still have an array, but our sample disposable objects are now all gone. Nice. Now let's continue the demo and just um, Create again 10,000 items, so let's do that. Trust me on this, I'll just collect a snapshot and there will be more uh, 10,000 new sample uh, disposables in memory. Then I'm going to run a garbage collection and get a second snapshot there. What we are going to see is that by uh, calling iDisposable and cleaning up stuff ourselves, we can see that our second snapshot, so this is our first one, this is our second one, we can see that our second snapshot immediately no longer contains the sample disposable objects. So they are no longer in memory, and if we go to the snapshot, they will also not be on the finalizer queue. Reason for that is that in code, in the code of my sample disposable, uh, what I did there is I uh, basically destroy the file stream myself and free up the handle that I opened in the constructor of this object. Again, helping the garbage collector uh, help me and helping it clean up memory fast. Right, so that's uh, pretty much that. Let's close the profiler. Yes, kill all. All right, back to the slides. Uh, let's talk about allocations a little bit. 
when do you allocate memory uh, in your code? Typically, when you are using a value type, like an integer, a Boolean, a struct, a decimal, and etc., you are allocating on the stack and not on the heap, which means that the value type that you are allocating is not managed by the garbage collector. It will be on the stack, and when it gets, uh, when it falls off of the stack, it will just be removed from memory and will no longer be available. For reference types, though, whenever you new or whenever you create an empty string, you are allocating memory on the managed heap, and that memory will be managed by the garbage collector. <clears throat> A question that I once got was, I don't do news, I only use uh, the I container, and I let that thing create objects for me. Of course, that thing internally doesn't new, so that also means that memory is being allocated, right? OK, there are some hidden allocations as well. <clears throat> Uh, here's some example code where you, you have an integer, which is a value type that sits on the stack. Um, <clears throat> when we assign that int integer into an object, we are actually boxing this integer, and an object will be allocated on the managed stack. Nice other thing there is that if we take that int out of this object box, or we cast it again to the integer, um, that's not really allocating because, again, we are allocating this new integer on the, on the stack. But what it does is we need some CPU effort to unwrap this object into an integer. So don't do things like this where you have a value type and then cast it into a reference type and back and forth because you're actually making hidden allocations there. <clears throat> There's some other hidden allocations as well. For example, params arrays are one of those. And if you're making use of lambdas and closures, you're actually also allocating some compiler-generated classes to capture the state of execution. And we'll see that in a little bit. How can you find those hidden allocations? Well, uh, experience is one thing. So uh, the longer you are in the .NET space and the more uh, software you write, the more experience you will get with finding hidden allocations. Um, other good ways of finding them are by using intermediate language uh, tools. So basically a tool that looks at your C-sharp code and gets the intermediate language off of it. <clears throat> uh, there's one in ReSharper, as we will see in a little bit. Uh, you can, of course, also use the profiler and just look at what is being allocated and which hidden allocations may be happening. And if you're using ReSharper, there's a plugin called the Heap Allocations Viewer plugin that will also visualize whenever something is happening or whenever you're allocating memory. And uh, the Rustling guys also created their own version of that same uh, type of plugin. So depending on what you are using, you can make use of any of these two and uh, find hidden allocations in your code while you are typing and writing the code. Again, don't do premature optimization. Always measure what you are doing. Right, let's look at some hidden allocations. Uh, Back in our code, let's go to demo two. Uh, what I have there is some code. I have the boxing ring here where I have the example of boxing that I have. Uh, what I want to do is basically prove that a hidden allocation is happening here. And the way I can do that is by making use of an IL viewer. So what I can do is in ReSharper, uh, just Alt Enter and go to the IL viewer. And what we can see there is the IL representation or the intermediate language representation of what we have. Uh, we can see our methods. And whenever we click around in one of the windows, uh, the other window will highlight whatever we selected. So if we go to this allocation of the integer, we will find that it's this portion of code. And we're actually loading an integer onto the stack. So that's no problem. The thing is that uh, we are boxing here. So the fact that we are assigning this integer into an object means that we are actually loading this location from the stack, but then we are boxing it using a boxing statement into an object of type um, system.int32. So it's actually allocating an object to store um, this value in. So intermediate language can really help us if you sort of learn how to read it in discovering this type of uh, allocation. So boxing is quite easy because it's a tree line code and the box is in there. And if you hover the IL statement, you can actually see a tooltip uh, that says we're actually converting a value type to an object reference and allocating memory. Right, let's look at a couple others. Uh, I have another demo here where we are validating arguments. So what I'm writing here is a method. And let's maybe close the IL viewer for a little bit. 
what I have here is a method where we want to sort of guard that something is true. So I have a class called ensure where we are saying we want to make sure that this directory exists. If it doesn't exist, render this uh, exception and uh, use the name of my parameter as, um, as sort of the exception type. So if we go to this method, we can see that if our condition is false, we are throwing an argument exception with our exception message and the parameter name. Awesome, really nice. Thing is, we are allocating quite a bit here. So if we again look at our IL viewer, you'll see that uh, we are doing quite a number of things. We are, let's go there, we are calling um, directory.exists. Okay, that's nice. That's the thing we want to check, so that's a good thing. Then we are uh, loading a string from memory. We are making a call to a method called string.format, which internally allocates a new string, and we're allocating the name of directory uh, string as well. So that's three allocations in there. Problem is, if we go into our method, there's actually more allocations because it will check for the condition. And if the condition is false, we are also allocating a new exception method, uh, a new exception object. So let's see if we can optimize this code and have less allocations there. I have a second attempt here where instead of having the string in memory directly, I'm actually passing in a lambda where I'm generating the string only if the condition is false. So if we go to this uh, code, you will see that we are checking the condition. Um, and if the condition is false, we are then only calling the method that generates the string and then um, generating the exception like that. So that's all nice. Let's see how many allocations we have in there. So while we think that we are just passing a delegate, what we are actually passing is a compiler generated object. So what we are doing here is, if we go to the IL code, uh, what we are doing here is creating a new uh, instance of display class one underscore zero, which is a compiler generated class that has one property, which is um, the thing that, that actually uh, that, we're, that we're calling. It has a string as a property and we are passing that around. So the thing is that we actually made it worse that instead of allocating a string, by using this lambda, we are now allocating a hidden class and a string in that class. So that's definitely no improvements. Let's see if we can try it in a third manner. In the third uh, version of this code, what I'm doing here is I'm also ensuring that something is true and I am passing in the arguments like I did before. So I know I'm allocating the string and so on, but let's see what we are doing inside of this class uh, or inside of this method, sorry. Uh, what we are doing is instead of allocating this new string beforehand, so running the string.format beforehand, we are now running it in here. Problem is, if we are passing it this uh, arguments array, so the, the number of parameters for the string.format function, what's actually happening is that we are calling and loading an entire string array, which is again a hidden allocation. So uh, yeah, how to solve that? Well, the way .NET solves it for, for example, string.format is by creating several overloads. So what I did here is I basically took the same version like my is true tree and I created two versions, one which takes one parameter, arg0, and one which takes two parameters, arg0 uh, and arg1. And then instead of passing them in as an array, I'm just passing them in one by one so that I'm using the correct overloads. And if we now look at the IL codes, we can see that we are just loading the arguments and not really allocating a new array in there. Right. So that's one way of optimizing something and hidden allocations in terms of params. Arrays are really evil because they always allocate an array, even if like in this version, you're only passing in one specific string, which is uh, quite sucky. Okay. One important thing here in this entire talk is do not optimize what should not be optimized. Again, I can't stress this enough, always be measuring. Um, we want to know when allocations are done, but perhaps those don't matter, the allocations. We want to make sure that we are only optimizing what we have to optimize. So measure, 
how frequently are we allocating, how frequently uh, do we collect, what generation are our objects on, and are our allocations introducing pauses. If all of that is okay, don't optimize. If something is wrong there in that list, well, maybe you have to optimize. But the only way of knowing is by measuring. And you can do that using .memory, .trace, or any of the other tools that are available. So let's see what we can measure. Uh, I have another demo here where I, as a Belgian, am loading beers into memory. So I have this big JSON file, which takes forever to load on uh, my machine. And this, because it's a, I think it's a 60 megabyte file uh, that I found on the internet that should contain all the Belgian beers. So that's 60 megabytes of beers there. Um, and once it loads, and I actually shouldn't have double clicked it in Visual Studio, once it loads, we will see that uh, it is a JSON file that contains the brewery name, the name of the beer, a rating for the beer, and the number of votes or something like that. So uh, four variables about our beer. And we are building an application where we are keeping track of the ratings of the different beers that are available. Uh, right, Visual Studio is hanging on me. Let's give it two, two more seconds to load. But the lesson here is don't load a big JSON file. Let's restart the demo. Right, so what we are going to do in code while Visual Studio restarts, uh, what we are going to do in code is load this JSON array and parse it into a dictionary. So our JSON has four properties. Well, what I'm actually interested in is the beers by brewery and uh, the rating of the beer, because that's what I want to show in my application. So let's open up our demo here and go into our beer loader class. That's the important one. In our beer loader, uh, we are loading the object. And we are loading it in a dictionary. So this is the di dictionary that we will be using. We will have the brewery as the first key of the parent dictionary. And then per brewery, we are keeping a dictionary of beer names and their rating. That's what we want to have from our JSON file. Now, I have an insane version, like the, 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 the not optimized version, where I'm just reading all text. I'm just loading the entire beers uh, JSON in memory. Then I'm parsing it using uh, json.net. Uh, then I'm going over the entire JSON array and then creating entries in my dictionary. I don't have to tell you that this is not the optimized way. This is not an optimal way and you shouldn't be doing it like this because our 60 megabytes of beers are in memory once as a string, once as a J array, and then a third time in my target's dictionary. So this is not the way of doing it. I've optimized that and I wrote my codes differently. I'm not insane, I'm not using this method, I have a different method. My other method is instead of parsing the entire string uh, or the entire JSON file as a string at once, I'm just using a stream reader and streaming the JSON as we are reading it. That's nice because that means that I only at the most have a couple of JSON objects in memory and then for every JSON object, I'm immediately putting it into my dictionary and then uh, discarding the JSON objects again. So that should be optimized, right? Um, I'm not going to run the profiler because I have some other demos that are really interesting, but I do have a snapshot that I captured this morning. So if we look at our unoptimized version um, in Dot memory, what we will see is some crazy allocations happening. So you see all this Bart Simpson hair in the timeline there. That is because we are continuously allocating new and new memory while we are loading the beers the first time. That's okay. Um, the problem is if you load the beers for a second time, which is this time range here, if you're loading it for a second time, we are loading it again in memory, allocating a bunch of memory, then all of a sudden we have a garbage collection happening apparently, and we drop back to probably having all the beers in memory just once. So that's not optimal because we are first of all allocating a lot of memory, and here we are allocating memory twice, and that's not what we want to have. Uh, the reason for that is that between these two snapshots, uh, what happens is if we look at the memory traffic, 
we are uh, regenerating, sorry, if we look at a comparison of the object numbers, we are allocating new objects of type string. So we are allocating 253,000 new strings and deallocating 253,000 new strings. So if we load our beers two times, we are actually putting them in memory twice and collecting all those different strings and all those different J objects over and over again. So that's not the way we want to do this. If we only want to load this beers JSON file once, that's probably okay. But if we want to load it multiple times, this is really going to work against us. So the way we can solve that is, if we go back to memory, uh, to our code, by reusing objects. So instead of, um, so I'm basically doing the exact same thing here. I'm streaming my JSON file, but instead of creating new dictionaries all the, all the time, what I'm doing here is just trying to get the value from my current uh, beers dictionary and overwriting the rating. So if it exists, I'm just overwriting the rating instead of creating a new dictionary and allocating all that memory again. If we look at the snapshot of that execution, let's uh, try that as well. Should be this one. Uh, if we look at the snapshot here, again, the first time we load, we see all these allocations. But the moment we uh, reallocate the entire array or reload the entire JSON file into memory, we can see that memory consumption is pretty much stable. And the reason for that is, of course, that we are not creating a new dictionary there over and over again. We're just updating the existing one that we already had in memory. So the good thing there is no garbage collection has to happen here. Um, and we're actually make, keeping the garbage collector happy again. Also, if we compare these two, you will see that uh, in between two loads of my beers JSON, I'm no longer allocating new string objects or garbage collection, uh, collecting string objects. So this way is much more efficient to load the array. Point that I wanted to make here is always be measuring what you are doing in code and always measure um, with the profiler if an optimization makes sense or not. One thing to take away from this is if you want to uh, load lots of data in memory and you know that the data may change a little bit, but a lot of objects will remain the same or the shape of the object will, uh, will remain the same, make use of object pools. Reuse objects that are available um, because you are allocating fewer memory, which means you're also invoking the garbage collector less uh, when you are doing that. Memory traffic is also going to be lower, which means that the garbage collector, again, will not be triggered as much as before. Uh, there's a pattern called the object pool pattern, where you can basically just generate some objects beforehand and then reuse those over and over and over again. Uh, if you look at the slides, there's also an article to uh, the ASP.NET Core GitHub uh, page, where they describe a way of using object pooling to optimize some scenarios in ASP.NET Core. It's really interesting to read. Right. Again, don't optimize what shouldn't be optimized. Um, by that, I mean the garbage collector is optimized for high memory traffic in short-lived objects. If you are allocating a lot of strings and deallocating them uh, within a few lines of code, don't fear allocations. Don't go with object pools and crazy uh, constructs just to optimize memory usage there, because in that case, the garbage collector will be smart and fast enough to just clean up the objects and not get in your way. It's the concept that makes .NET thick, so just use the garbage collector. But again, measure, do know when allocations are happening, and do know when the garbage collector is uh, collecting memory in Gen 2, more specifically. Right, um, let's dive into strings. Strings are also an interesting object type. Strings are objects. Um, if you write codes in uh, Visual Studio or Writer, what you will see is that you're typically making use of a lowercase string uh, construct. It looks like a value type, but it's actually a reference type. A string, if you go to the decompiled sources or, um, or, or find the .NET sources online, you will see that a string is a collection of chars and also has a length property where we keep track of how many chars are in that uh, read-only collection. There's a bunch of operator overloading happening to make sure that it looks like it's a value type, but again, it's a reference type, which means if we are creating a new string using the constructor or by just using double quotes and creating the string, we are actually allocating objects on the managed heap. 
Right. Uh, I'm not going to go into this one. Um, well, maybe quickly. What you can do is if you profile your application, um, if you're using dot memory, what you will see is that if you have a, an application that has a lot of strings in them, uh, you can see that there will be string duplicates. So when we are assigning or creating a new string in memory, the string may be duplicated in memory. So I attached uh, the profiler to Visual Studio this morning. And what you will see is if we open the snapshots, that there's a lot of string duplicates in there. So that memory analyzes that for us, and we can see that there's various class names and so on that are in memory over 500 times. So if you wonder why Visual Studio is consuming that amount of memory, well, here's your answer. OK, uh, let's skip this entire demo, because yeah, it's nice. But again, you can download the sources and uh, just go through it. Right. String duplicates are actually something that you will see in any .NET application. If you run a console application that just uh, waits for inputs, you will see that it also allocates a number of string duplicates. Uh, System.globalization, for example, if I run an application on my machine, I will get all the different weekday names in memory at least three times. So string duplicates will happen, and they uh, will be in memory of any .NET application. Are they bad? Well, no. Uh, the .NET garbage collector is fast enough if you have short-lived string duplicates and so on, so it will be fast enough. No worries there. The thing is, if strings end up on Gen 2 and there are duplicates on string 2, you're probably wasting some memory, so you may want to optimize that. Again, it's okay to have strings there, but do measure, and if you see that you are wasting 60% um, of the capacity of Gen 2, well, maybe you should do something about string duplicates. Um, there's, of course, a few tricks in the .NET framework as well. Um, string literals, for example. In this code example, do we know if all strings are on the heap and if they are duplicated? Well, if we would run this code, we would see that A equals B, both in value as well in, as in reference. Reason for that is that the compiler will, in the compile stage, see that these hello world strings are the same and only store it in memory and in our assembly once and just reference it for both these variables. So in this case, the string is only in memory once because they are in there at compile time. Well, they, they can be compiled into our assembly. Problem is, um, let's skip that one as well. Problem is, uh, if we do something like this, where we are reading data, for example, from the console or maybe from, um, from a database or something like that, what we are doing is we are loading the string in memory twice, which means if we would run this code, we would see that uh, A equals B in value if we would type hello world twice, but the reference would not be the same. Reason for that is it's two objects that are allocated in memory. Luckily for us, we can do something about that, and that's called string interning. By making use of string interning, uh, we can store and read strings from a pool that is uh, called the intern pool. It's a, it's a dictionary, basically, or a hash set that sits in memory where we can intern strings and allocate a string using this method. So if you look at this code sample, you will see that we are calling string.intern. And what will happen is .NET will check if this specific string, which is my block URL, is already in the intern pool. If it's not, it will allocate it and add it to the intern pool. But if it's in there, it will just reuse the existing string and just make use of a reference. So if we would run this code and assign a million blogs or blog URLs into a list of strings, this string would only be in memory once because we are interning that string. That's really nice. A um, couple of caveats. Uh, not all strings are interned by default. Good question could be, why not? Well, the answer there is it's a CPU-bound operation to look if the string is already in memory or not. So that's the reason why it's the typical balance between CPU and memory. Also, the strings that you are interning are not on the managed heap, which means they are not garbage collected. They are on the intern pool. And the intern pool is an object that sits in the app domain. Which means if we start an application, and especially, for example, in a long-running application like a web application or some kiosk software that runs forever, all the strings that are in memory 
by interning them will remain in memory forever or until the application is closed. So that means interning is good, but it can also work against you if your application runs too long and you're interning too much uh, data there. Uh, as a rule of thumb, if you have long lived but not a lot of unique strings like uh, reference values that are being used, like 10 reference values, for example, interning is really good because you're not duplicating those. If you have lots of long lived but many unique strings, there's no ben real benefit of interning because you have a lot of unique strings. Uh, they all sit in memory and you're basically wasting memory in that case. If you have lots of short-lived strings, don't intern, just trust the garbage collector that it will clean up those strings. But again, measure to make sure. This is just a rule of thumb. Always uh, look in a profiler and see if, uh, if things are better. Right, um, I have a good 10 minutes left, so let's explore the heap a little bit and see how things fit together in the .NET framework. So, um, how would you build a type system in a managed language? Say you are building your own uh, programming language and you want to have something uh, similar to the .NET framework. How would you build it? Well, typically what you would do if you want to make it memory and CPU friendly is something like this. For every type, you store the properties that are there, the fields that are there, the methods that are there, etc. Then you create another dictionary, for example, where you store the field data. You say, okay, there's an object of this type, and you can go to this first dictionary to find out what the properties are called. Here's the data for them. So you would store all those things separately, uh, keep things like inheritance information and so on, um, and then just reference. And that's also how .NET works. Things you allocate on the stack are simply pointers. You allocate them on the stack, so not really interesting. The more interesting thing is the managed heap, where if you allocate an object, you're actually allocating, uh, you get a pointer to an instance. That instance has an address, in this case, uh, this one, and it ma uh, maps to a table that contains other pointers or other addresses and some values. So it knows that, for example, for this type of object, uh, all our runtime type information sits at this specific pointer, and then we just get the field values that are in this object. By doing that, we don't have to store all the type information all the, type. We uh, all the time. We just store it once in a separate table and then just store the values of all the different objects and, of course, some information about what type of object is in memory. So this makes it more efficient by just basically mapping from table to table. Um, so again, it's just mapping mappings. Uh, you have a pointer to an instance. The instance points to some runtime type information and field values. And then our runtime type information points to interface addresses where you can find the methods and things like that. Right. Theory is nice, but practice is, all, uh, of course, much more fun. So let's look at CLRMD. Uh, CLRMD is a package you can find on NuGet, um, and it's a tool that allows you to either open crash dumps or attach to running processes and look at what's inside the memory. There's a long definition. My definition is it's linked to the managed heap, which is quite nice. Um, I'll give you a quick introduction just to uh, sort of make you aware of how it works. So I have a project here where I have my CLRMD Explorer, which is the application that I will be running and that uh, contains the CLRMD uh, logic that I wrote. I also have a target application, which is basically just a simple thing uh, that we launch. It prints Hello World onto the console. Uh, we run it and then every second we print the current date time uh, to the screen. So nothing complex, but we want to analyze the memory usage of this application. The way we can do that is by making use of CLRMD. And what we are doing here is attaching to the process. So we are starting our target application. We're waiting for a couple of seconds and then attaching to that process. Once we do that using CLRMD, we can get information like the CLR version in use, the runtime version, the app domain, etc. Um, we can look at process info. So we can dump, for example, the version of the CLR being used, the file size, the timestamp, 
the data access file, which basically contains the mappings that I talked about earlier. Uh, so mapping the type information to whatever is in memory. Uh, we can dump things like our threads and so on. So if we go into this dump thread info, what we can do is simply ask the runtime, give me all the different threads. We can print some information on the thread, like the ID, or is it a background thread and things like that. And for every thread, we can look at the current stack trace. So we can just enumerate that and run through it. So let's maybe run this application. And as you can see, this is our target application. It's running. It's printing the date time uh, to console every second, if all goes well. It's not. Anyway, this application is attached, and we now get CLR info of this application. So when a CLRMD was able to get the CLR info. I'm also able to get runtime info, so we can see where this application was launched from, uh, which config file was used, etc. We can look at our threads. So we have five threads running, a foreground threads, and a couple of others. Um, and we can see some background threads there as well. We can see the different objects that are in memory. So that's a lot of them. Uh, we can see the objects that are on the different generations. So in here, we can even see the different generations that are being used by this demo application. Again, uh, using CLRMD, we can quite easily do that. Um, if we want to just walk the heap, we can just get the heap from the current runtime that we attach to and dump the objects. So the way we dump objects is we enumerate all the different generations. For every object, we go to our first mapping table and we get the object type, and then we can get the value of that object type uh, and so on, and just print it to, uh, to console. The thing I really want to show here is that we can use CLRMD to do some automated profiling as well. So in my application, I wrote, where is it? Uh, a tool which is called dump string duplicates. What I can do is walk my entire heap, find all the different types of every uh, object that is in memory. If it's not a string, just ignore it. But if it is a string, we can count the number of strings and get our duplicate values. So if we continue our application till that point, we can see that we have duplicate values. And like I told you, uh, the month May is in memory 16 times, duplicated by .NET. Different month names are in memory eight times, etc. So again, by using CLRMD, we can watch whatever is happening in memory, and we can sort of write an automated analysis tool for whatever is in memory. Now, there's uh, one thing that I do want to check. This should run, right? Yeah, I should run. Uh, one thing that I do want to do is write something that is in dot memory. So if we would run our target application, let's set it as a startup project. If we would run this application, we are creating a new timer. We are creating a new clock. The clock is disposable but we are using it in our timer callback. And while our clock may be disposed after this using, the timer is still around, which means that our clock will probably also still be around. In uh, .memory, we can easily see this by profiling the application uh, and just running it and getting a snapshot from the application. Hold on, wait for it should be fast. So the application is now running, should print hello world and then starts the timer ticks. There we go. So it's now ticking as a timer. And we are expecting it to have disposed of my clock class again, or of my clock object again, because it's out of scope. We uh, disposed it by making use of a using statement. Well, if we get a snapshot, we go to the list of objects in uh, dot memory. We search for our clock. We can see, first of all, it's still in memory. And if we go to the details of it, we can look at the key retention paths, and we can actually see that the clock is being held in memory because it's still referenced from a timer callback, which is in a timer queue, etc. So we can see the hierarchy of objects that is keeping my clock in memory. Let's see if we can make use of CLRMD to find out uh, the exact same information. Let's Set this again as a startup project. 
what we will do is instead of uh, dumping duplicate strings, etc., what we will do is dump the retention of my clock objects. So let's maybe first run it so we can see what it does. The application is running, we are attached, we get all the information, string duplicates and so on. That's a lot of strings. But we also get the retention path of my clock object. We can see that the clock is kept in memory by a timer callback, which is in a timer queue and so on. So we can actually see that using CLRMD as well. The way we can find this out is by playing garbage collector for a little bit. What we are doing is, again, we are walking the entire heap. Every object that is on the heap, we are checking the type. If the type is not of our clock type, then we don't care, we're not interested. If we do find our clock, we have our root object. Or at least we don't have our root object, we have the clock that is being kept in memory. Next thing we are doing is, if we have our clock, we are enumerating all the different roots. Uh, the roots are typically objects that are yeah, the, in, in the highest place in the hierarchy of objects and are referencing my clock either directly or indirectly. What we are doing is we are enumerating all the different roots and then for every root, we are getting the path to our object. So what we are doing is we are walking the heap just as a for each, then Whenever we find the object, we are walking all the different routes, and for every route, we see if we can find the retention path there. So again, CLRMD just gives us access to whatever is in memory, but we can use it to either mimic or rebuild that memory from scratch. But more importantly, it's a really useful tool to automate some common analysis of something that you are investigating. So it's really uh, useful. Sample code again is on GitHub if you want to uh, drill down into the details. Right, in conclusion, um, what you can take away from this session, I think, is that the garbage collector is a really useful tool. It's optimized for high memory traffic and short-lived objects, so it's really good at that. Um, but if you have other types of objects, you should be careful a little bit. Don't fear allocations. They're not bad. Garbage collector is really good but do beware of Gen 2 collections that may pause your application for a long time. Um, string interning may make sense, may make no sense in your application, but measure again. But most importantly, don't optimize what you should not be optimizing and measure. Use a profiler, use CLRMD, use, uh, we actually have a tool called dot memory unit where you can profile your unit tests. It's really useful um, to automatically check your entire application for memory issues. Um, this entire talk is in some form on my blog, so if you want to look into the example, read all the different sites and so on, uh, go to my blog and uh, read through it. If not, uh, let's see what questions we have here. Um, can you share the link to the GitHub here? Uh, I will do that afterwards. Um, I see another question stating, in turn, strings um, are part of the app domain. I have read that they are longer in memory. Um, it depends on the .NET version. Typically, um, string interring, keep into the back of your mind. Whenever you intern a string, it is in there forever, as long as your application is running. That's basically it. Um, any other questions there? I don't see any other questions uh, out there. Um, if you want to find more information about dot .memory and our profilers, just go to the blog. Uh, feedback is welcome on Twitter. Um, a recording will be made available on YouTube and on our blog afterwards. And for the two remaining questions, I will just uh, yeah, reach out to you and just answer your personal questions in person. Uh, thanks for joining, and uh, if you want to rewatch this webinar or other webinars and screencasts, we have a YouTube channel. Do go there and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thank you.